Father, into thy hands we commit the rest of this time that we have together. We have sung, we have worshipped, and we have praised you. And Lord, we have lifted you up. Now, God, tonight we come right now with our eyes upon you, with our children, with our families. We come and stand before you, Lord, as your little sheep, O oh God. And we give you praise and glory and honor. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we know the name of the Lord. And Lord, you promised us that you would set us on high because we have known your name. Now everybody that knows the name of the Lord, but you lift that name up in praise right now. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. love you Jesus I love you Jesus cleanse us in your precious blood Hallelujah. Just, just let the Lord just fill every nook and cranny every niche in this building and in our vessels keep your eyes closed for a moment do not talk with your friends only converse with the Lord. This is a holy time. So converse with him because he hears and he knows. If you want to tell him you love him, this is an appropriate time to do it. Respond to his love right now and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 I love you, Jesus. You are the great God. You are the mighty God. There is none like you. Hallelujah. 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 I bind every foul and unclean spirit that would hinder the preaching of the word. I bind every demon who would try to clap taloned hands over the ears of those who need to hear the word of the Lord. Open our ears and open our eyes and open our hearts. In the name of Jesus, the Christ, the living God, the mighty God. Father, we stand in your presence. In the presence of Jehovah. We're standing in your presence, Lord. We're standing in your presence, Lord. God Almighty. Prince of Peace, grab a mic. Troubles vanish. Hearts are mended. Troubles are vanished. 
famishing right now. Hallelujah. Now would you close your eyes and would you lift your hands to the King of Kings right now and say, sing it one more time. The lift your hands to Jesus if you're not ashamed. Of Jehovah. That's it. I praise you, Lord. I you praise are God you. Almighty. Oh, God, you are almighty. You are my Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Jesus. Such a beautiful, beautiful presence of the Lord. Why isn't that why we come to church? Just to praise Him, just to be in His presence. select a few people that would like to come and join me on the platform. It's going to help me when I call on you. Brother Tim, you just come on up to the platform. Brother Eric, I'll ask you to come. Brother Keith, if you come. Brother Lloyd. Just a few folks that I've asked to help me. And some I didn't ask. Game on is a phrase set at the beginning of usually of a competitive event. It's a phrase that people use when they want to express readiness for a challenge. When someone says, game on, it means I accept this challenge. I'm ready to get it done. So tonight, if and wherever or Whenever, in the message, you feel like doing so, instead of amen tonight, I'd like for you just to say, or shout, game on. And you'll know the appropriate time when you feel led to do so. Just shout it out. Game on! Game on! Game on! Game on! Okay, so, here we go. I'm going to the prophet Haggai. And I'm going to uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can get them out. And if not, you can look up on the wall. So we'll print it there for you. Haggai chapter 1 and verses 2 through 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and 
bring the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified saith the Lord you looked for much and lo it came to little and when you brought it home I did blow upon it why saith the Lord of hosts because of my house that is waste and you run every man to his own house and tonight I'm going to preach to you for a few moments on game on now let's pray together Lord Jesus we give you praise and glory and honor you are the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace hallelujah I'm gonna lift my voice hallelujah bless your name Jesus I exalt you and I praise you Lord I lift up your name because you are great and you're greatly to be praised hallelujah Jesus hallelujah 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 and you may be seated in the name of Jesus and could somebody back those fans down about halfway please so my Bible will stay open thank you after Cyrus king of Persia captured Babylon in 539 BC he made a decree that the Jews were allowed to return to Palestine and rebuild the temple that had been destroyed 47 years earlier by Nebuchadnezzar and his Chaldean armies. Under Zerubbabel and other leaders, about 50,000 Jews returned to Jerusalem in 538 BC. They soon began work on the temple and with the help of skilled Phoenicians, the foundation was laid in 526 B.C. Excuse me, 536 B.C. Amid great rejoicing and thanksgiving, and it's recorded in the book of Ezra. Unhappily, their efforts were stalled by opposition of the Samaritans, who had been living in Palestine since the 7th century. These Samaritans asked Cyrus and his successor, Cambyses, to stop the work on the temple. And they pointed to the number of times Judah had rebelled before the exile. Apparently, the Persians succeeded. And they, uh, excuse me, the Samaritans succeeded. And the Persians heeded their complaints and intervened because little work was done on the temple between 536 and 520 BC. In the year of 521 BC, pardon my history lesson, Darius the Great came to power and after quelling a series of revolts, he adopted a policy of supporting religious activity throughout his empire. Now, when this happened, it should have brought a quick response from the Jews, but instead, they made no effort to resume building. They had become content to live without a temple. Although the temple had at one time been the focal point of their very lives and of their very nation, the work in the, up at the temple had been stopped years ago, and they had given way to lethargy. They were lethargic. And even though Darius had said you can rebuild the temple, not one of them picked up a hammer or a saw or a nail. They had become complacent. Haggai knew that if he could awaken their love for God, he knew that if he could stir their love for God, that why things could change and and change rapidly you see love will find a way indifference will find an excuse but love will find a way some people think that the opposite of love is hate but I will tell you the honest truth of the matter the opposite of love is indifference The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. 
And Haggai knew that the only person that is worse than a quitter is the person who won't try. And he looked at these people and he looked at them and he said, it's time. Game on. It's time for the temple to be built. He knew every person needed to be involved. And he also saw that they had given up their dream. They'd given up their hope and their ambition to build the temple of God. And so he wanted them to try. Well, Haggai took to preaching. His preaching kind of reminds me of something that happened in the, in the life of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln once listened to the pleas of the mother of a soldier who had been sentenced to hang. He had been sentenced to hang for treason. But this mother came and she made her case and she begged the president from the heart of a mother to grant a pardon. And Lincoln's heart was third. And he pardoned her son because of this precious mother. But as the mother was about to leave, Mr. Lincoln said, quote, Still I wish we could teach that boy a lesson. I wish we could give him just a little bit of hanging. Under divine anointing, Haggai appealed to the people of God. He gave them a little bit of hanging. He kind of draped them for a few minutes over hell, to, so to speak, and told them what was going to happen if they didn't get with it. And then he gave them great promises of what God would do if they would get with it. Amen. Haggai began preaching. He began to remind them that with God, all things are possible. Under divine anointing, Haggai appealed, to, appealed for them to renew their efforts and to once again pick up the hammer and pick up the saw and pick up the equipment and rebuild the temple that they had started so many years ago. You see, the temple foundation had been laid 16 years prior. It had been laid 16 years previous. And then because of persecution and because of distractions and a number of reasons, the work had slowed and then stopped. So Haggai began reproving them for neglecting the building of the Lord's house. And he, he said, is it time for you to dwell in your, your beautiful homes and, and the house of the Lord to lie waste? Is it time for you to, to be busy about all your businesses and all your stuff that you're doing and be contented that the temple should lie in such a horrible state? He excited them about it. He put emotion into it. He showed them how that if they did not answer the heed, the need of the hour, and if they did not heed his call, that they were just, well, they were putting their money into bags with holes in them. Right. That they were not going to prosper, that God was not going to bless them because they had come to the kingdom for such a time as this. They had come to the kingdom for a special time and there was an anointing upon them and there was a blessing upon them and there was a call of God upon them. And he told them, you can go about your lives if you want to and you can ignore the ruins of the temple and you can leave with just the foundation and, and we won't have a temple. But I promise you this, he said, when you put your money into bags, the bags will have holes in them and you won't have enough to do anything with. Wow. He promised there would be no satisfaction. That there would not be enough drink. That they would not have enough food. That they would never say, I've got enough clothing to satisfy them. Because they were not just an ordinary, mundane, mediocre people. They, they were a God-called people. They had a mission and he said, if you're not about your father's business, so to speak, if you're not a busy accomplishing that God-given task, you just won't be satisfied with anything. You'll be disgruntled 90% of the time. Haggai encouraged the people and under divine anointing said, be strong. 
all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Don't worry, he said. God is with you. The Lord told me to tell you, he said, that I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And, and you are to be strong, and, and all the people of the land, saith the Lord, and, and work, go to work. Stop talking about, well, it's kind of raining today, so I think I'll forget the plans for today. And yeah, I got a little rheumatoid arthritis uh, kicking in here on my hip. I think I'll just stay home today. Or, or uh, you know, a thousand other excuses that indifference will always offer. But my, how the people of God responded to the preaching of Haggai. Oh, how they responded to that anointing. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to report to you that the people of God came alive. They responded to the challenge and they said, we'll do it. And revival broke out. A great revival broke out. The people were convinced the people were committed. They committed their lives to God. And everybody put their shoulder to the wheel. The work on the temple began afresh in 520 B.C. And by 516 B.C., just four years later, the task was completed. The temple was rebuilt and worship was fully restored. Because a preacher said, I'm not going to allow you just to sit there and be distracted. I'm not going to. They'll never be able to get back into his presence. I cannot stand the thought of that. Now in the name of Jesus, game on. So we've got to see the city converted. Every child belongs to God. Not one child, I don't care who they are or how abused they've been, belongs to the devil. Every person has a right to come to a place and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody needs to feel what I felt this morning. Everybody needs to feel the presence of God like I'm feeling. And let me tell you something, my dear brothers and sisters. While we have the blessings of God every day of our lives, there are some people that have never felt one little iota of the presence of God like we feel him every day. And somebody ought to say, oh, that's not going to be that way anymore. They're going to feel the presence of God. I may not be eloquent and I might butcher the king's English and, and I might not know as much as somebody else, but I've got one talent and I'll take my one talent and I'll go out and, and I'll help somebody to know the Lord and, and I'll tell them if I, if I don't have the answer, I'll I'll find the answer, but I'll tell you, I'm going to give it an effort. I'm going to try. Thank God for the church. I don't know which one of these mics up here is working. Unmute it. How do you unmute this thing? Because someone witnessed to Brother Lloyd. Come here, Brother Lloyd. Give him that microphone. Brother Lloyd, I'm glad you're in this church. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to tell him where you were when God found you. Put that microphone right next to your mouth and tell him what was going on. God found me in the back alley. Drunk, dying, I heard the voice of God. He asked me to come down, and he said, Lloyd, I want you to go to church. I want you to get healed. I want you to go to church. I come back to church, and Freddie Clark was here one night, the healing minister was here, and he prayed over a lot of people in here, and he healed them. And he picked me out up on the stage here. He says, Lloyd, down here, can you very good? I said, no. He took my hearing aids out, put his fingers in my ears. Pulled them back out. He says, can you hear now? I said, yes, I can. He says, can you, he walked off a little bit. He said, can you hear now? I said, yes, I can. Yes, I can. There you go. 
And he says, can you hear now? I said, yes, I can. I said, I can hear beautiful. I said, more than I ever did my whole life. I can hear the birds now. I can hear anything. That's good. Huh? Now, Brother Lord, what were you about to do when, just before Jesus saved you, what were you thinking about doing? Walking out. See, Lloyd was on the verge of suicide. Yeah, I was. But somebody told him about Jesus. Yeah. That's good. There's all kinds of people that are just like Brother Lloyd. They're just waiting for somebody to invite them. Waiting for somebody to ask them. They're waiting for somebody to say, We've come in the name of Jesus. We've got power of God to help you. You don't have to commit suicide. Jesus, the giver of life, is here to help you. Brother Tim, I don't know what the church means to you, but I kind of put him on the spot and give him any advance notice. But what has God done through this church for you? Oh, I'm not much of a speaker, but... <laughs> Put it up close to your mouth. I'm not much of a speaker, but God has given me a second chance. Several years ago, back in 2005, my, my son Joe was, my wife and I, we were just lukewarm. <laughs> we were good people, but just not really living for the Lord like we should be. And it took my son in 2005 getting a, a brain tumor and an operation and and a diagnosis that they got it all, but he had to have an operation, but um, the doctor said we got it all, but, you know, there's a chance that we didn't, so we're going to have to do some chemo, radiation, all that stuff. And uh, um, so in that doctor's office is where I, I could have gotten real bitter, but I chose to get on my knees right there in that doctor's office. I gave my heart back to the Lord. I begged him for forgiveness, and he's turned my life, my family's life around, my son's life. Joe is saved now, I believe, and, and I still have some work to do with my family, but with your help and, and a lot of prayer, my son and my family and... Remember, Jennifer's watching this. <laughs> my family... Like I said, my family <laughs> are going to come back to the Lord and, and be renewed. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Tim. And one part of the story that he didn't tell you, I hardly ever go to a concert. But my mother likes Bill Gaither concerts. So to honor her, I got a couple tickets to Bill Gaither's concert in Bangor. Went to the Bangor Auditorium. The tickets all had a seat number. I found my mom's seat and my seat, and my seat was next to the seat of Tim Cluley. Hundreds and hundreds of people, and I took a seat number that put me next to Tim Cluley, and we did a little talking that night. Come on now, folks. This is our hour, and God said, I'm putting Tim Cluley on the team. Brother Keith McRae has been here several years, but he's got a, a story I want him to share with you because were it not for the Lord, the church, and his walk with God, well, Brother Keith just wouldn't be standing here right now. Tell him. <clears throat> the setting is Memorial Weekend 2005 on a Friday afternoon. I'd had heart problems for about 10 years. Sitting in my office, I wasn't feeling well, so I told my son I was going home. 
Instead of going home, I went to the hospital. And as I was in the emergency room, they were running tests. They said, we really can't find anything, but we're going to admit you anyway just because of your past history. So I called my wife, told her they were admitting me. So I was in ICU. They're running tests, in and out all evening. Family's gone home. And it's about 2 in the morning. And I'd had nurses coming in and out all night. But this woman walked into my room that I hadn't seen, kind of plain clothes. She comes up to me and she says, you need to get out of here. You need to be in Portland and you need to be there tonight. Huh. She says, I can't convince anybody to ship you. She says, only you can do that. She says, and you have to be persistent. And she walked out of my room. So I rang the buzzer. In come two interns. Two o'clock in the morning. So I said to him, I says, uh, have you called my cardiologist in Portland? And they said, no, it's Memorial Weekend. And I says, well, you better find somebody that can. We don't have authorization to do that. And I says, then find somebody who can. So they left my room. In comes this doctor and he says, are you still not feeling well? And I said, the only thing you have done for me is pump me full of morphine and let me lay here. I says, I want you to ship me to Portland. I want you to call my cardiologist and tell him I'm on my way. He leaves the room and I could see him on the telephone down there. And he comes back and he says, the ambulance is on its way to get you. Thank you. My wife probably got a little bit of a scare because they called her at 2 in the morning and told her she needed to come to the hospital. And then she tells me afterwards the only thing she could think of was that I had passed on. So she calls my son who lives closer, figure he could get there before her. So Chris shows up and I believe Brother Stevens was there. Well after the doctor had left the room, all of a sudden this woman walks back in the room. She says, you did very good. She says, you're going to Portland, and I'm going with you. Now, I can tell you, I've had five or six ambulance rides to Portland, and I've never had a nurse go with me. So we were downstairs, and just before we get into the ambulance, we had prayer, and she steps into the ambulance, and she takes charge of the back of the ambulance. And we're on our way to Portland, and she's on the phone, and she's running tests, and She's telling me, she says, you haven't got a thing to worry about. She says, I got this little bag right here and I got everything I need. So we get to Portland, we get into the emergency room, and the girl says, uh, we need to admit him. She says, we don't have time. She says, call security, unlock these doors and get him on the seventh floor, they're waiting for him. So they get me to the seventh floor, and it, now you still have to visualize, this is Memorial Weekend on a Saturday now. And there's about eight people lined up in the hallway. They take me right into a room and they start doing an angioplasty on me. The doctor says, uh, have you thought about open heart surgery? I says, not in the last year. He says, well, you better think about it right now. He says, because I got a surgeon on his way. So the surgeon comes in and he says, you need open heart surgery. I says, when? He says, right now. So he brings my wife in, he talks to, talks to her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I was supposed to be in surgery for four or five hours. I think I was probably closer to six or seven, but afterwards the doctor tells my wife, she says, one at 100% block, two at 80, one more hour in Augusta, and he was dead. So in recovery, a couple of days later, I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to call the hospital. Uh, uh, the girl that was in the ER was uh, Naomi Henderson. So I called Naomi, and I said, uh, 
Uh, they shipped me down here. I said, they did open heart surgery. I said, I'd like to talk to the girl up in ICU. So she transfers me up to ICU. And I can't remember what the girl's name was now. They had no idea who I was talking about. No idea. Never heard of this girl. All they know is, is they put me in an ambulance and shipped me to Portland. God made a difference. One more hour, and he was dead. But because he's living for God, and has the Lord on his side, God sent his angel. Hey, church, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God is ready to do great and mighty things. I want to thank God for the church. I want to thank God that some of us would not be here were it not for the miracle power of God. And I know that some of us have gone on to be with the Lord. But that's not a defeat. That's a victory also. I want to thank God for Sister Connie and Sister Cheryl who prayed and, and prayed and witnessed to their mother. And brought their mother to the house of God a few weeks ago. And that senior citizen went down in the water in the name of Jesus and came out speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance. I want to thank God for all the prodigal sons and daughters that God is bringing back to the house of God. I rejoice with Brother Ronnie and Sister Melissa and I see the changes that God is making in their lives. Can anybody get excited tonight? And I got to tell you that there's many, many more of our sons and daughters that are still out there. And so we must press on in prayer and we must go forth. And let me tell you something else. While you're reaching somebody else, God will reach down and touch yours. You can't be sitting at home and expecting God to do a miracle for you. But if you'll put your hands of the harvest, God will not be your debtor. I said, God will not be your debtor. Put your hands into the harvest field. Brother Eric, I want you to come and say something right now. So thankful for the mercies of God. I, uh, Talked to you guys not long ago. Some of you heard some of my story. Some of you didn't. Um, grew up on a Pentecostal pew. Fell away from the Lord 20 years ago. And there's only really four people in this place that really knew, knows what happened. Um, fell away from the Lord and just kept going further and further away from God. Kept running. Had the call of God on my life as a young boy. And uh, started running and uh, worked on the coast, digging blood worms. And I was the boy that five o'clock in the morning, everybody's drinking coffee. I had my can of alcohol in my hand. Buy a 12 pack on the way to work, buy a 12 pack on the way home from work. And I'm just so thankful. So, so thankful. You may have seen tonight, I don't, you probably didn't notice when I'm singing that song, I've been delivered. But the second verse says, the best miracle to see is when from sin he set you free. Because you know that when he set you free, you know you're free indeed. So thankful, so thankful for what he's done in my life, what he's done in my family's life. And so the Lord told me to tell you, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He told me to tell you, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And, and these signs shall follow them that believe. As we are taking the message out, you may not be as much a scholar as you want to be, but I'll tell you what will happen. The signs that God has promised will follow those who believe and go. You can't have the signs if you're just sitting there not doing anything, but if you're willing to go forward. You see, I'll never forget. Many years ago, there was a, a boy and his uncle that decided to take a sailing trip off the coast of California. The boy's name was David. I don't remember his last name, but I remember his first name was David. They went at a time when there was a chance that there could be cyclones or hurricanes, but they went anyway. Long story short, they went outside the shipping lanes and took a more direct route and the unthinkable happened. A huge storm hit them overturned their boat and they ended up in a life raft for days and finally the uncle was scratching a message into an empty can and David said uncle what are you doing he said I want you to give this message to my wife what are you doing he said there's not enough water for two of us we're not going to either one survive if I stay in this raft. Son, I'm getting out. Please, here's my wedding ring. Give it to my wife. Give her this message. And he said, no, uncle, please don't, don't do it. Don't do it. The man went overboard and he swam away. And David said the last thing he saw was that man turned around and waved and then swam away and sunk beneath the waves. It was several days later when all the water was gone and the raft was half deflated that some Portuguese tuna fishermen saw David's little raft and they thought it was just debris in the water and tuna have a way of congregating around debris. So they said, before we go back, let's just check out that debris over there and fish over there for a few moments. And as they got closer, they said, oh my, it's a raft. There's somebody in it. He's alive. David was incoherent. His tongue was swollen so large he couldn't speak right. But as they pulled him over and he flopped over onto the deck of this fishing trawler, he kept saying, another man, another man. There's another man out there because all David could think about was his uncle who was still out there somewhere and in his state of mind he was saying over and over again another man I'm going to go to bed tonight and if Jesus comes by way of rapture a heart attack I'm ready. But there's a whole lot of people out there that if they just had one chance, just, just, one, just one chance, if somebody would get up off the sofa and go over and say, would you let me teach you a Bible study? They'd say, yes, of course. There's another man out there. I feel the presence of the Lord in this house, and I'm asking you please to bow your heads with me. We are at a pivotal moment now where we either go out and make a difference in our world, or God will reach around us and, and take another group and use them instead of us. I am most determined that that cannot and must not and, and shall not happen. I am saying my heart, although I'm talking right now with a fairly low voice, my heart is screaming, game on. Game on. If I have to sacrifice, game on. If I have to do a little bit less in other areas, game on. 
Why, why are you willing to do that? Another man. There's, there's another man out there. All kinds of people just waiting. And guess what, folks? It doesn't do any good to pray the sinner's prayer with them. It doesn't do any good just to say, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and never explain to them what that means. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Somebody with the truth has got to share with them the truth of repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, what did you accomplish? Did I read it right? Am I right? Does it not say, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God? Stop. Stop soothing your conscience and saying, Well, they're okay as long as they leave. No, no, that's not true. That's just salving your conscience. You know what the truth is, don't you? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And who said that? Jesus. And if our gospel be hid, it is him hid to them which are lost. Lost? Lost forever? I, I cringe with horror to think that any of my friends would stand and face me at the judgment bar and say, you knew this? And my name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I went to church with you. We talked about Jesus at times, but never one time did you tell me what Peter told the early church that they must do. Who? Who's going to allow that to happen? Well, I'll tell you what I see. I see this church filling up, Brother Keith. I, I see us building another building over there. I see us starting other churches that God helps us to do so. I see daughter works springing up and preaching points. I see a revival that's going to scare the devil to death. I say no, we are not going to accept that we have just a small percentage of the people of this city. No, we're not going to accept that. We're not going to stop until all the city has a chance to turn to God. So if I'm a Sunday school teacher, I pray that God would give me new fervor and fire and anointing. And when those little kids come up, I want them to see Jesus in me. If I'm a Christian school teacher, more than I want them to learn their arithmetic in English. And I want them to learn that. But I also want them to learn that this is where they can learn about Christ. And, and they can follow Christ. And they can be saved and know the Lord. And, and, and it's safe here. And I want people... To right now begin to say, if you know Acts 2.38, that's enough for me. I want you to say, I will teach somebody a Bible study. If it's nothing more than sitting down and reading through the second chapter of Acts with them and giving them a chance. It's not fair that they don't get a chance. Hey, a postcard came to the wings and they're here tonight. Somebody knocked on some of your doors. I sat in Keith and Donna's house many years ago, week after week after week, teaching home Bible studies to those heathen. And God saved them. And here they are today living for God and serving the Lord. Will somebody tell me, is it time? Is there not a cause? Can we not grow now? Is it not possible that people would be saying, I've never seen anything like it in the whole state of Maine. I'm telling you, the crutches are piling up in the corner. They're putting crutches up on the walls. I can see it right now. Can you see it? I can see God doing great and mighty things and people being saved. For you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So would you rise to your feet with me now? The success or failure of this message cannot be told 
entirely by who comes forward and who doesn't. By the way, Dwight and Marianne Tibbetts, they love God. No one had ever shared with them what I've been sharing with them, except for maybe Brother Lauren. And tonight, after receiving Bible studies, they said, we want to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Not only that, but Dwight's brother Dan was healed from cancer by the mighty hand of God. And I shall never forget going into that hospital room and praying for him and feeling the anointing power of God going through his body. And he will tell you that it's because God that he no longer has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And God is ready to use your hands. But somebody's got to say, okay, I'm not one foot in the world, one foot in the church. I'm not one foot casual, one foot red hot with desire. I am going to be God's follower. I'm going to be an ardent disciple of Christ. It doesn't matter if I get what I want or not, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I am a warrior! And you pull out your sword and you say, okay... I may not be the smartest or the brightest, but God called me and I must have something to give because God don't make no mistakes. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. I cannot express to you what the result of this message will be. I can only hope that from this message there will be many people who will start at least one Bible study. There will be some that will volunteer for Christian service. Some will say, all right, I'll start another bus route. I don't care if I get embarrassed or not. I'll go, give me a team, let's go. And people will begin to share their faith wherever they may be. And some who have been intimidated by their peers will rise up and say, hey, I got to tell you something because you know what? I really do care. And I don't want to rock your boat. And I know you love God. But have you ever been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins? And somebody says, well, they'll be offended. You know, that's like saying, don't cry fire when your friend's sleeping on the couch. You're going to irritate him by waking him up. That's foolish. Scream fire to the top of your lungs and shake his couch and help him get out of there. Don't say, I don't want to rock the boat. Rock the boat. Now, I know that there are some people that there's been a while that you haven't been serving the Lord and you're here tonight. I know that the devil tried to take your faith away from you and he told you that God doesn't care and he's not involved and he doesn't love you. But God is looking for another team member right now to join Alpha Team. Team UPC. And I know you failed and I know there's been some stuff going on that it's not pretty. But the enlistment lines are open right now. And if you'll come and ask God to help you, your life is going to change. This will be a pivotal moment and I, I can't do it for you, although I love you very, very much. You have to make your own choice. And it will have forever results. So I'm, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, is there one person in this building tonight who would say, game on. 
I failed. I haven't got it right. But if God will have me, count me in. If that's you, you begin to make your way down here. Count me in on the greatest revival that has ever come to this state. Count me in. Count me in. The reserves are being called up. Jesus Christ is about to split the clouds. And God is ready to use you like you've never been used before. I wish you'd say game on and move to the altar. I really want to spend eternity with you. I don't want to be separated from you forever. I don't want you looking up in heaven and seeing me shouting and dancing. And you not be there with me. allow you to miss your moment in the sun. I'm not going to allow you to miss this pivotal moment in your lives and in your generation. This is a generation. Haggai was preaching to a generation that would make the difference for generations to come. That temple needed to be rebuilt and it wasn't going to get any easier and they weren't getting any younger. So he basically told them, this is a time, and if you'll get up and work, God's going to bless you. And if you won't get up and work, then you're not going to be satisfied with anything in life. You'll be the most restless people that God ever created. You'll be the most unhappy people that God ever created. But if you will be about God's business, and if you'll go to work, then I promise you, God says, I will be with you while you work. It's true that history repeats itself. I stand here with an urgent message from the Lord. You can treat this like any Sunday night that you want to. You can sit, plug your ears, listen, whatever you think is right. But I know that I heard from God. And it wasn't just today. I was at General Conference this week and while I was there, the Spirit of God began to deal with me, and I opened up my Bible, this Bible right here, and I happened to have some paper, and I began to jot down notes as the Lord was impressing me. And what the Lord was talking to me about is simply this. Once again, the people of God have come to a pivotal moment, a pivotal time in which we can launch forward, or we can just be satisfied with what we have. We can go, go forward and see God do great and mighty things like we've never seen before. Or we can kind of sit back and put it on cruise control and just kind of fake it for a while. It is a pivotal moment. Once again, the people of God are at a crossroads. And I tell you tonight that God has brought us to this day. I look around this church and I have to tell you that God has assembled this team. Now look folks, there's never going to be a time when everything is perfect the way you want it. There's never going to be a time on this earth when everything is going to be ideal. Garden of Eden. Everything is just prime and proper and there's no bumps in the road, no potholes, no obstructions. That is a fairy tale. Every time that there's an opportunity for the church, the other team comes to church. They put their mouth guards in, they put their helmets on, and they take their positions, and they line up against me. There's never been a time when God would offer an opportunity to his people but what the devil would show up to challenge that opportunity and say, you're not going to do it. 
you're not going to make it. You're not, you're, you're not going to have this revival. This church will, has reached its pinnacle and, and you can just enjoy it and, and have a good time and it'll slowly dwindle down as years goes by and as the elders slowly die off and, and the young people won't be as fervent as the elders were and, and they won't be as committed as the elders were and, and uh, you, you basically have reached your... In every era of time, when God presents an opportunity... It is always an opportunity that is surrounded by difficulties. Always an opportunity that is surrounded by problems and situations. But in every era, whether it be back at the rebuilding of the temple and the Samaritans trying to stand in the way and say, you're not going to be rebuilding this temple. Or Nehemiah when he's rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and Sanballat and Tobiah or say, ha, 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 if a fox was laying against that wall. But they just buckled on their sword and picked up the hammer and went to work. And in 42 days, they built the wall of the city of Jerusalem because the Bible said, quote, the people had a mind to work. And I'm looking over this crowd tonight and I'm telling you that God is not crazy. That God is, is not Foolish that God knows exactly what he's doing when he called you and I to the kingdom. Each one of you have a talent, a gift, something that you can do that's going to make the difference. And God knew that and so he called you and he put you on the team. Now you can complain about your uniform not being the color you want it. And you can complain about the helmet's not quite the right style. Or something else that might get your fancy and, and you kind of do like the pilot did who fooled around with a $2 light bulb and ran into a mountain and killed himself. And we can be distracted by the distractions that the devil's always going to send when a great revival is about to be birthed. But I, I have been so excited all day today. I have been, I'm still excited right now. There is a revival that's breaking forth in the city of Augusta and in central Maine. We have had some great meetings. We've had some great moves of God. We've had a lot of people baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost over the years since this church has begun. But I'm telling you, I know in the Holy Ghost that God is walking up to us and saying, okay, game on. It's time to go forward. It's time for everybody to do what God has called us to do. And here we are at a pivotal time. And God has assembled this team. The day of decision has arrived. Now. Are we going to win this fight? Are you for us or are you against us? State your case. Are you with us or are you against us? Are you for a revival that will sweep this county? Until, until it gets on Fox News and ABC and NBC and CBS. And, and people are saying, uh, we, we bring a report that in this city of Augusta, that the, the blind are seeing and the lame are walking and the deaf are hearing. And, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. We bring incredible reports of, of people with incurable diseases that have been cured of their disease and it's documented by medical science. And we bring reports of, of people who have been addicted to drugs and alcohol and broken homes and broken marriages. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know how to explain this, but something supernatural and phenomenal is happening in the city of Augusta and in central Maine. There is a people in the city of Augusta and in the surrounding towns uh, that have decided that this indeed is the end time and that their Lord Jesus is about to come back and they're laying everything aside and they're making their very most important and greatest effort for the kingdom of God that we've ever seen anywhere in the state of Maine. I hear the voice of the Spirit saying game on. What will we become? Where will we go? Listen how many souls can we affect? 
Will we step forward and take the leadership role that, that God has asked us to take? Or will we settle for the mediocre, the average, and the mundane? Actually, the average is only, or the mediocre, they're only the best of the worst. Will we accept the challenge of a lifetime and make a difference in our world before Jesus comes back? Does anybody here believe that Jesus Christ is soon to return? Will we use our God-given talents for the Lord and hear our Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Or tonight, will we bury our talent in the dirt of distraction, only to hear our Lord say, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm here tonight to tell you that God is calling up all the reserves. Your retirements are canceled. As far as from the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, if you've, you've got an able mind and you're 93, you can still teach a Bible study. Amen. All reserves are being called up. What's going on? There is a humongous revival that God is sending to the, the city of Augusta and central Maine. There are people even right now that God hears the cry of their lost soul and he's troubled by it. He hears the cries of the lost. He sees them marching, ever marching toward the abyss, marching toward hell, not knowing that they're about to drop into a lake of fire that burns forever, where the Bible says the fire is never quenched and their worm dieth not. And the Father is hearing the cries of all these people, and he's looking to the church, and he's saying, church, game on. Amen. And so here we go. Are you ready? God would like for us to renew our altar of communion and fellowship with him. Prayer still changes things. When it seems hardest to pray, that's when we should pray the hardest. When all hell is coming against us and saying, it's not going to happen, that's when we need to grab a bucket of water and start running toward hell. Come on, when the devil says, I'm taking your kids to hell and there's nothing you can do about it, we need to collapse to our knees. And begin to intercede and begin to pray. When the devil says you'll never reach this city, this city is too wicked. There's too many people that do not care. And, and, and we don't have the talent that they have in other places. That's a lie. God has assembled the greatest team I could ever want. Right here, I'm looking at you. Arguments never settle things, but prayer changes things. And God is calling you to be a warrior of prayer. The book of James says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know why the devil wants you to be so busy you don't have time to pray? Because prayer changes everything. The lost that are in our city are dependent upon our prayer. We need to have fervent prayer. My God, in the name of Jesus, if you're one of these people that's looking at your day timer, looking at your cell phone, looking at your iPad while you're trying to pray, why don't you shut that thing off and really start praying? It's time for fervent prayer. I'm going to tell you something. If you were the person that was one inch from falling over into a flaming lake of fire, what kind of prayers would you want to be going up on your behalf? Would you want folks that are sitting in the church tonight that are so concerned about their personal comfort that they don't care if you go to hell or not? 
Or would you want people that fall upon their face and say, Oh God, in the name of Jesus, no matter what it costs, I don't care what I have to sacrifice. I want to win a soul for you. I want the souls of this city to be saved. Lord, I am giving myself to prayer. I'm going to pray in the morning. I'm going to pray at noon. I'm going to pray in the evening. I'm going to pray without ceasing. I'm going to be a prayer warrior. I am going to be the devil's nightmare. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray about everything. Everything. I'm going to pray about my kids. I'm going to pray about my grandkids. I'm going to pray about my job. I'm going to pray about my friends. I'm going to pray about my finances. I'm going to just commit it all to prayer. I'm not going to sit around and be distracted. I'll take the disadvantage and turn it into an advantage of prayer. Yeah. And not only must we have fervent prayer, we need effectual prayer. And that is why Jesus gave us the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. It wasn't because he needed to pray. He knew we needed to pray and we needed to learn how to pray effectively. So he said, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That is an effective prayer. And if you take that prayer and, and you begin to pray the different elements of that prayer, you will be praying effectively. And then if you'll turn up the fervor, you'll be praying fervently and effectively. Amen. Amen. Tonight I come with the summons to sacrifice. There is this gap between idealism and practicality. Where we say, God bless Brother Stewart. God bless him. And if we're not careful, we can have a schedule that has very little God time built into it. But God bless Brother Stewart, our missionary to Liberia, who every day battles with the plague of Ebola. But somebody has got to say, all right, I'm not called to be in Liberia. I'm called to live where I live. God, help me to be willing to give of myself. In order for me to have the revival that God wants me to have, I've got to be willing to sacrifice I cannot, I cannot have revival that's convenient. I cannot have a revival that it, it fits my schedule and, and it goes along with my urges and my desires. Oh God, to see God's best, I must be willing to give my best. So tonight, I wonder how many would be willing to rededicate your lives to God right now. Willing to dedicate your lives to God. Is there anybody here tonight that would say, I dedicate my finances to the work of God? Oh, now, preacher, you, you, you didn't have to talk about that. You know, I, I'm not so sure about that. Oh, yes, you are. You know it's going to take a sacrifice. But don't worry. God will more than reward. I sat in a service the other night that I have never sat in one like it in all of my days in Pentecost. I felt like I was sitting in Acts chapter 4. Where the people were coming up to the apostles and they were bringing their possessions. I, I was sat in a service where one man walked up weeping, a businessman. He said, I, I just sold a business for 150000 As soon as I get home, I'm going to send $150,000. I saw people walk up, they were poor, but they had a tie on. They took the tie off and said, may I give this tie? I saw people slip rings off and say, take this and sell it and use it. And at the end of that service, 26 missionary families were sent to the foreign field on the sacrifices of those people in that service. Do you think for a moment that those people who sacrificed will end up with a short end of the stick? I don't believe that for one Philadelphia minute. 
But I believe that God is ready for the team to step up to the plate and say, okay, then I will sacrifice. I will give of myself. It doesn't matter what it costs, but I want to see revival spread. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, it's time. A summons to sacrifice. I need to dedicate my time to God's kingdom. I can't see this revival and do it in just a couple minutes a week. There's no business in the world that can flourish that way. I've got to be willing to sacrifice. Somebody has got to be willing to go out and, and teach a home Bible study when you could be sitting down at home drinking iced tea and enjoying family time. Somebody's got to say, okay, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I taught a Bible study, but game on. I rededicate myself. Where's that chart? I'm going to go find it and dust it off. I'm going to get my Bible. I'm going to read up on my teacher's manual. I'm going to go out and teach somebody the word of the Lord. Game on. Game on. I want to dedicate my service to God. You know, I appreciate so very much those who are working for the Lord. I appreciate our, our Sunday school teachers who sacrifice. I appreciate our bus workers who go out. I, I appreciate our Christian school teachers, our home Bible study teachers. I appreciate everyone who's doing something for the kingdom and they're giving it all they've got. I appreciate those who are new to our church family and they're trying to find their place. What can I do for God? And, and I appreciate those who have musical abilities and they're using it for the Lord. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. It's time for everybody to use whatever talent that God has given you. And let me tell you something. Everybody has at least one talent. Ladies and gentlemen... It's time for boots on the ground. Game on. I heard one or two game ons. I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me, and I'm telling you, wonderful people of God, it's time for boots on the ground. Yeah. It's urgent. When the young lad David stepped onto the battlefield and saw that nobody was answering the challenge of Goliath, he asked a question that still haunts me to this day. He said to his brothers, he said, is there not a cause? How, how can you sit in these tents and, and eat your, your sandwiches and eat your cheese and, and drink your drink? And, and, and there's a giant standing up there saying, send me a man. He said, is there not a cause? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares to defy the armies of the living God? Well, if none of you will go, I'll take my sling and I'll go and God will go with me. And the victory that could have been yours will be mine. That's right, You see, I've been reading this book, and I'm troubled tonight. I've been reading this book, and it says, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Does, does anybody believe that? Do you believe that without this gospel, that Jesus is coming in flaming fire and he's going to take vengeance upon them? Do you believe that some of these people that are some of your friends and my friends that we meet on a daily basis are, are headed toward a lake of fire who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord?